Mount Keminis, or Mount Cauldron, it resembles the pot used in witchcraft. For today's adventures, we set off to climb its peak and attempt to understand sacrifice and the hidden meaning of a witch's cauldron used on Halloween. During the last episode, we walked from the inn to the Draco Stonehenge and learned the history and the meaning behind Barber and Bear Lake and how the stars above explain the nearby town, Swastika. Our next challenge will be to walk all the way back and continue the pilgrimage to climb the Holy Mountain. We hope to complete this 30 kilometer hike in under seven hours and make it back to the inn before dark, when the bears and the wildcats begin to hunt for food. I tried walking all the way from here to the mountain uh, twice and it was only about an hour. If you're up for walking an hour and you don't have any other transportation, say you came in by the bus and you took a cab to get here, it's definitely doable. I left home in 2013. I was overworked and had a nervous breakdown that resulted in losing the job I loved shining shoes and cleaning washrooms. I had lost my home, my friends, my entire way of life and prayed to God that I could find a way out of this deepening depression. I began to dream of exploring up north near rivers and mountains, so I googled places I could visit. First I camped on the Black River in Raymore, next to the abandoned military base, and learned of the UFO and Bigfoot encounters. A calm replaced the feeling of dread and despair, but my vision quest was not yet complete. I had marked multiple mountain peaks I wanted to climb a chain of dormant volcanoes. When I first lay eyes on Mount Keminis, I knew my prayers were answered. The road leading up to the mountain reminded me of Masonic art. The lodge, the winding path through pillars, the body of waters that ship gold back to the Holy Land, the offering table facing back to town. The first night I camped up the top, I witnessed a vivid Milky Way and more shooting stars than I ever thought was possible, and I even stumbled upon a hidden cave. Well, I managed to make it back and get some more food. Now I'm on my way to Mount Keminis. Give you guys a little bit of a look to see what it looks like from a little bit of a distance. You can see that it's divided in half. Sort of like a King Solomon's pillars. Right there is actually where I'm going to be climbing to and filming is the offering table spot. So I still got a bit of a hike. I've only got a few hours until it's going to be sunset so I'm going to try to get all the filming I need done before then. Yeah, it's not going to be an easy hike just because I'm a little bit tired from already walking about 20 kilometers today. And I was fasting for a while too, so a little bit low on energy, but well, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so if anyone's wondering how to find Mount Keminis, and you get pretty close to it. This is what it looks like from the entrance. Oh, there's Google. Yeah, that was funny. The Google car just drove by. <laughs> Yeah, and it's located right on the, there's the border of Quebec sign on Highway 66, Mount Cauldron. Oh yeah, they still have that as the name here. Just like Halloween, the Witch's Cauldron. Yeah, fitting that I'm here on this adventure for Halloween, so. All right, I guess my break's over. I gotta start climbing up the mountain. Some believe the first witch's cauldron was used by the Anunnaki gods. They carried it full of holy water and dipped pine cones inside so they could spray it on things that needed blessings. This is the type of cauldron that was even used by Quetzalcoatl. If you think back to Swastika from our last adventure, it was based on the spinning star pattern always visible in the northern sky. And if you look over to Larder Lake where the Draco stones stand, you find something hard to believe. 
Ancient legends say the gods had the ability to manipulate nature to display important clues. When the gods take selfies, they don't share it on social media, but instead here we find the image of Quetzalcoatl in the lakeshore. Just so has it, his twin brother is the Aztec version of Anubis, known as Zotl, a man with a monstrous black dog head who guides souls of the recently deceased. If this is too difficult for you to believe, turn your attention to the full moon. It's not really a man on the moon, but instead a jade rabbit, and its story of sacrifice is found both in Aztec and Asian folklore. It sacrificed itself into a witch's cauldron to save others, a touching and important clue to solving why sacrifice is also found on this holy mountain up north. If you read the French Wikipedia for Mount Keminus, you find it's actually called Mount Caudron, named after the ancient cast iron pot used by locals and witches. English speakers know it as Keminus or a place of shamans and healers. Long before Europeans arrived in the Americas, natives called this mountain a place of sacrifice. Warring tribes even used it as a battleground. Locals told me horrific stories of village women being captured and thrown from the top down onto the jagged rocks. Sadly, in 1955, the body of a man without a head, both hands, and right foot was found on the top. Close to him was a hunting rifle, but no cartridge in the chamber. He was wearing clothes from the city and not the local attire. He had no ID in his pockets and nobody was reported missing, leaving police to wonder if it was murder, suicide, or sacrifice. Now, that's kind of neat. As I was coming into the mountains road, uh, the Google car drove by and took some photos, so I might be out front on the road in front of Mount Keminus from now on with my magic bag theory right in the open. All right, but here I just stopped to take a little shot of the, the offering table from the bottom. There's where I'll be flying the drone off the edge of. Oh man, just looking up at that makes you wonder, what have I got myself into? <laughs> but it's going to be one heck of an adventure and might as well give it my all, so here we go. <laughs> While in town, I noticed a sign calling the mine operations a mile of gold, but actually the ore body stretched much farther. It was known to be under Timmins, Swastika, and even under the Draco Stones in Mount Cauldron, and even into the other towns in the neighboring province of Quebec, a line of gold that was awfully familiar to the ley lines I had been researching. One thing that caught my attention when looking at this gold line up north that connects all the, the gold mines like Kirkland Lake, um, the Timmins, and all the way through Quebec, is it happened to remind me of ley lines. And I had actually been gotten really into ley line research thanks to a documentary called uh, Revelations of the Pyramids. And they talked about ancient ley lines that connect like things like Stonehenge or the Great Pyramid of Egypt and so forth. So we'll bring up the revelations of the pyramid line. And this one starts at what is it, uh, Easter Island uh, through the Nazca lines, uh, passes over the Great Pyramid of Egypt, Angkor Wat, and all the way back to Easter Island. And you can probably tell that the line has a slight bit of a wobble to it. And that's something that I found interesting with a lot of these ley lines is they either appear to have changed or the earth shape has changed. And we can imagine that the Earth's shape is always changing, so it's in a constant state of flux. Might explain why some of these lines have slight wobbles to them, or that the pattern appears to fit better on a smaller Earth rather than the full size Earth that we have today. So how this connects to the Draco Stonehenge site, I'll bring it all up here. So... What we have here is the Draco Stonehenge, or the site by Mount Kebanis. And we'll show exactly where it connects. Is there's the beach where the, the standing stones are. And if you happen to follow this line, it actually goes all the way to Easter Island. And what some people might also find interesting, that the Moai, those uh, giant statues on Easter Island, this line, if you follow it all the way back to the Draco Stonehenge site, you'll never guess what it passes over. <coughs> you know, pe people have visited uh, 
Tobamori and Manitoulin Island region might know of a place called Flower Pot Island. And Flower Pot Island also happens to have like giant stone statues that have like legends associated with giants. Like one of the islands that's near here uh, happens to be Giant's Tomb Island. Uh, apparently the the last location of like one of the, the last living giants. And yeah, there's definitely different legends about the, the stone giants and it's interesting this line connects. So yeah, and if you follow it all the way through to Russia, the Russia side happens to have a location that's also like giant stone statues. I'll put a slide up in the top to take a look at it. So that's some of the, the, the research that connects the, the Stonehenge site and different other ancient sites around the world. And how this has to do with the sacrifices on Mount Keminis is you may have also heard that different legends throughout the globe, like the one we talked about earlier in the video, the, the witch's cauldron, the sacrifice on the moon, uh, the rabbit, how it was sacrificed. Well, there happens to be another sacrificial line that's connecting on this map, and you can see it here outlined in green. And what it happens to be is the airport, uh, Boston Airport, you may have heard from the September 11th attacks where the planes were hijacked. It also connects to New York City where the World Trade Centers were and the Pentagon. So it's very weird uh, that all the, the deaths that occurred sadly on September 11th uh, appear to be on one of the ancient sacrificial lines. So that's where I started to realize that this idea of like sacrificial spots being on lines happens to be like a involved in the very foundation of our earth and what's another one oh yeah then if we're able to switch it over to the view of mars uh, but before we do that what i did is i redrew the map today with all of earth's current measurements not going on how it used to be in the past and this is basically how the map line outlook looks and it just so happens to be that all these major lines happen to be like the equator or the tropic lines, tropic of cancer and that stuff and the arctic circle. And the only difference is, is these lines are great circle lines where they stretch around the globe just like the equator does instead of getting smaller as you get higher and higher in inclination. So what I can do next is I'll bring up a picture of Mars's topography and show you like the September 11th line and how it actually interacts with Mars as it is today. So we can see that these sacrificial lines like the ones that go connect the September 11th sites also happen to ca connect some of Mars's largest volcanoes. So that's where I started to realize like sites like Mount Keminis being on a line of gold makes a lot more sense when you take into account the bigger picture of how all these ley lines are connecting sites like volcanoes. So if anyone's wondering where like this ritual of like human sacrifice and volcanoes originates, this is one of my ideas for why. Yeah, so anyone's wondering when they're coming up the path to Mount Keminis why it's so wet and all this water. Here's a spot of a natural spring and it comes out and goes right down the trail. Makes it really slippery. So I recommend anyone who's had sprained ankles before definitely be prepared. Even if you've never had a sprained ankle before, wear proper hiking gear. You can see that this trail has definitely got a lot of sharp rocks and you could easily twist an ankle. Right, just to give everyone a little bit more background about how these ley lines connect to the gold line that runs through Kirkland Lake past the Draco Stonehenge through Mount Keminis and so forth is what we'll do is we'll bring up the the yellow baseline and you can see here that it does match like a lot of the geographic formations like the Great Lakes split around it Hudson Bay split near it the that bay um, Gulf of Mexico and how the ridge lines on the bottom of the ocean, they also connect with it. So we also got ones around Africa where you can see the continent split around it. And there is some uh, scientific evidence to, to prove that that's one of the locations. If 
you bring up on the file the the earth impact craters you can see one of the largest oldest impact craters happens to be right around this location and scientists tried to say that it was a meteor impact for a long time but now it's been rejected the idea that it's not a meteor impact they do not know what caused the basin but probably because they haven't really cracked these gravity well maps quite yet which i think some scientists probably have but it's a little bit of a taboo topic to discuss them so anyways if you follow the the impacts or the lines and how they illustrate the continents you can see it splits africa india southeast asia it draws around australia very clearly and a lot of the different bays you can see will create v's near where that is especially what the bay of Bisky and different ones around norway and so forth so what I did is when making this map, I realized that you can divide each one of these lines in half and in half and in half again, just like the orbs from Perry Reese. I'll put an image up above. I've actually got Perry Reese's book. It's very, very interesting. But anyways, so what you can do is divide the lines in half again, and you'll start to get more of the continents that weren't well illustrated before, like in South America. But you can also uh, divide them in half again, and then you'll get the red layer, which will show you um, the, the gold line that goes through Kirkland Lake. So what I'll do to make it a little bit easier to follow is I'll remove all the other lines and leave just the gold line for us to take a look at. So if you want to see where does the gold line go, and for I guess people that are into prospecting might find it interesting you can see that it's sort of beneath Timmins but I'm assuming that this line is actually probably pretty wide in general and gold can be within quite a few miles north or south of the line so we have the Timmins one we have the different Kirkland Lake areas you can see that who knows that maybe the gold is actually slightly further south or like I was saying that the gold can be a little bit above or a little bit below the line. So you've got the different gold mines in Kirkland Lake, Larder Lake, Virginia Town. Basically the general direction this line of gold is going on the highway, what is it, 66, that passes Mount Keminis as well. It's running parallel with the, the actual gold line, the ley line or the energy line that the First Nations people talked about harnessing energy from. So to give you an idea of just how many of the world's best gold mines are on this line, let, let's continue following it. So if we happen to go through this region, this region here, and what is that, uh, Newfoundland, or that part, yeah, Newfoundland, there's a lot of gold mines in this region. And if you happen to follow it through here, it cuts through the, the Congo, and a lot of the best gold mines in, in that region. And if you happen to go through Madagascar, it also crosses the best gold mines there as well. And if you go through the gold mines that are the best in the world, you also come across the ones in New Zealand. So it happens to cross the New Zealand gold mines. And lastly, maybe the best gold mine of all happens to be cuts through the ones in California. So if people have heard of the California gold mines, yeah, there's definitely, it could be a coincidence, but I find it very interesting that almost all the greatest gold mines in the world happen to be on the same energy line of sacrifice that Stonehenge is built on. It's funny, part of me was a little bit disappointed that I came so late in the season, but getting a look from the top and the different colors, yeah, it is a little bit nicer. Pretty sweet, the weather seems to have cleared up just in time, so I can't take a break for very long. I'm gonna have to book. Another clue about how these ancient lines connect to sacrifice happens to come from a, another great First Nations guy sharing his history of, about the different legends that involve sacrifice and how the, the planet actually works. So we'll give a shout out to him here. His video is called uh, The Story of Turtle Island, and it's by a guy named Jacob. So I highly recommend everyone subscribe and watch this video. It's rather mind-blowing. So how this connects to the ley lines is I watched his video, and part of it, it talks about the great turtle. So people have heard that Turtle Island is basically North America. It's the shape like a turtle. 
but what other people didn't know, myself included, that Jacob shared, is a part of the legend talks about how a giant's head was tied to Turtle Island. So I started to look at South America, and I think Jacob illustrates it in his video as well, that this South America island shape happens to be the shape of a giant's head. And can you tell which animal or a giant it's shaped after? I'll give you a little bit of a clue. It turns out that South America or the giant's head happens to be an elephant. And you can tell by the ridges of his forehead how his trunk even ends with like the, the holder part of a trunk. So how this sacrifice line grid happens to go, if you take this elephant head and you map it exactly, guess where the one of the central points happens to be. So we'll bring up the other uh, the lines here. We'll bring in the blue. So this just so happens to be the elephant's eye. So where, where one of the central wells is, happens to be the eye. And guess which draining from his eye? happens to be where one of the major forks is or one of the beginning points of the Amazon River. So as Jacob illustrated in his video that the Gulf of what is it the Mediterranean happens to be where the elephant's neck was cut off and the warm waters draining out of the Mediterranean into the ocean happens to be like the blood out of the elephant's neck still draining out to this day. Well, that's when I realized that this point of the central point where the eye is and the Amazon River, a friend of mine from Argentina pointed out that is correct, that the waters drain from this location, join into the Amazon and run out into the ocean. So it very much is like the, the great elephant or the great giant. His tears are the Amazon River, just like how the, the Mediterranean Sea draining into the ocean. So that's when I started to realize that, hey, this whole idea of sacrifice and being involved in our planet's creation and all the legends and mysteries about it seems to be a lot more truth to it than people realize. And it's wild that these lines that connect the sites of like Stonehenge and, and uh, Mount Keminis and the sacrifice there are part of a larger grid that connects the whole planet to sacrifice rituals. So that's why when I started to realize about that murder mystery that occurred on the top of Mount Keminis and the different tribes that were warring and throwing people off of the mountain and sacrifice by volcanoes like we've seen on Mars, how this all connects. Well, I made it to the top of Mount Keminis and got the drone shots finished with just a few minutes to spare. It was sharing images of this offering table on Mount Cauldron that I first met Maya online. She had posted the images of Pep Perikon in Bulgaria. I ended up taking that image and comparing it with mine, and I was shocked how similar they were. Not just the pools of water and the nearly identical elevation, but also the towns and the roads in the distance. To me it looked like it had a lot more in common. That's why when she told me hers had a Stonehenge nearby, I had to check out our area more as well. And lo and behold, I found Professor Bill Steer's blog on just that. And another thing that caught my interest was the gold mining. Thrace people in ancient Bulgaria were known to be the best goldsmiths in the entire world. And they had a supply so large people thought they had a secret mine very far away. Could it be as far as Canada? I was left wondering if my family's Anubis amulet had helped convince Maya to come all the way to Canada to see this possible connection for herself, and when she left, I felt so very sad. Comparing England's Stonehenge to ours in Canada turns up some other similarities. 
In both, you find a place called Dublin across the water, as if Dr. Reddick had his hands in that. And a place called New Canaan in the USA also had a holy mountain with very similar elevation and many gold mines all around it. I started to get the feeling that Freemasons played a big role in not just building things on earth to mirror the heavens, but making that pattern repeat in many spots around the globe. Thinking again of sacrifice, I checked to see what the holy mountain looked like that Jesus did his ultimate miracle on, and I should have guessed it looked just like Mount Keminus as well. This was the spot Jesus did a ritual that normally required sacrifice, but the Magi taught him how to transform into an immortal light being without killing the ox. Even in Roman Mithra followers, they believed sacrificing an ox would still be needed, a ritual offering that goes back to Sumerian times and even the feud between Cain and Abel. Noah's pagan side of the family would always go back to sacrificing the ox and fire worship the moment God left them. Eventually, this pagan way of life made its way to the Hittites. They could read and write not only cuneiform, but also early European languages, just like the red-haired Phoenicians from Syria. But the Bible also explained this knowledge had to be stopped, so the new tribes of Israel were ordered to wipe the last of it out for good. Before the beer, now only known to a powerful few. Running those circles, you might beat them too. And a knocky came for gold. Ancient aliens for the gold. From that guru for the gold. Since the Great Pyramid of Egypt has shafts pointing to Draco and Orion. I wondered if these other stars could be related to the ox sacrifice involving the witch's cauldron. And recently museums in Ottawa had shared Ojibwe cosmology that answered just that. They showed the Orion man with his arms reaching to the horned beast and all the way to the dog spirit of Anubis. Plus it shows how this man spins in the night sky explaining why so many other cultures had put wings or multiple arms or horns on their gods. Greece had called this journey from arm to arm, alpha to omega, or beginning to the end, after the alf, meaning horned beast. In Egypt, South America, and Asia, they depicted this god with a bent knee, and even placed his statue on tombs. Now I had a better understanding of what the Anunnaki wing disc meant, the god that spins in the sky above, and why so many offering tables and cauldrons had the image of a horned beast with outstretched arms and a ring around him. Just like the holy grail of witches, the Gunterstopp cauldron, so many question how Zoroaster revived an Anunnaki religion from the ashes that had been wiped out so many years prior to his era, but after learning it literally written in the stars above us, any shaman can access the same knowledge, even the aboriginals of Australia that you think would be isolated. When Albert Pike writes that the winged disc god of Ahura Mazda is the secret meaning of Freemasonry, it makes slightly more sense than it did before. During episode 18 of my Magi Show podcast, I was joined by a guest that kindly shared some history from Mount Keminis. To paraphrase, it involved a group of native warriors that needed to retreat. So, they climbed to the top of Mount Keminis in hopes of escape. At the top, they held their position, but their enemies awaited at the bottom for they had no other way out. As food supplies ran low, they prayed to the Creator for help. That was when the great Thunderbird, 
appeared to them and shot the mountain with a bolt of lightning, creating the offering table out of the solid rock. And the next day, when they awoke, they found sources of food to be plentiful all over the top of the mountain. Even to this day, when I camped, I was shocked at how big the wild blueberries are and how many different species of mushrooms you can find. Even the psychoactive amantias grow right next to the offering table. And for some unknown reason, the birds and other animals don't eat the wild blueberries, almost as if the creator had ordered them to be saved for people in the need of food. Yeah, this was kind of emotional for me. I was supposed to originally have 10 days to come up and do this trip, but my uncle's been in and out of the hospital with a regular heartbeat. So I got to go back and visit him as much as I'd like to stay here longer. I just thank the creator that I managed to get everything done. One day, hopefully I can make it back. Just so say goodbye. I'd like to thank everyone for watching this trip. I guess I'm going to shoot a few more clips on my way home and hopefully I make it back with the, all the footage in, in one piece. Uh, yeah, and I guess uh, I'd like to thank all my friends and family for helping me pull this off. <laughs> I really took everything I had. Money, strength, physical and mental endurance. It wasn't easy. Hopefully it's all not for nothing. <sighs> yeah, and here's one last look at the offering table before I go. And then a little zoom so you can see where where the Stonehenge site is. You can almost see one from the other. Maybe with some post-processing I'll be able to increase this. It's not the greatest lighting conditions, but... So there it is. The Stonehenge to the ancient offering table. Yeah, so basically my theory for this offering table. Yeah, my theory for this offering table is that Cain, the brother of Abel, after he was banished to Nod, came all the way up here to use this offering table here in Northern Canada. And the reason he was sent here by God, the Creator, or maybe even the Anunnaki, is because their fascination with gold this whole surrounding area is filled with some of the world's best gold mines, actually ranked number two in the highest quality. So then I think after Cain left here, he didn't like it because this is a really forbidding place. It's not easy. Usually there's so many bugs you can barely even survive. The food isn't greatest and has one of the harshest winters around. But after he wandered from here, he went all the way to South America. And then when he got to South America, he, be he built the, the great city of T. Enoch Titlan basically named it after his first son with his new wife that he met in that city or in that local area and he named uh, it after his son Enoch. Alright, well thanks everybody for watching my video and 
good luck. Hopefully it helps. 